recording. So, um, yes, essentially, like once all the exams from all the sections are have been graded, uh, like, you know, like there's like a Excel spreadsheet and like based on that, like you sort of decide, oh, the A should be here, the B should be here, the C should be here and, and so on. So like, for example, um, well, I can show you how in our class, I mean, I still don't have all the grades, so, but you can see like the histogram for, for, for our score, for the scores here. So like, say like, if this, if the cutoffs were just based upon this class, right? Like if the cutoffs were done on a separate basis, like maybe here would be like the A and the B would be more closer to the average, average and the C would be somewhere in here. So you see like, you just move around the, the, the cutoffs for, for A, B, C and so on. Is that making sense? Um, so um, I would, uh, the thing is like, until all the grades have been, all the exams in all the classes have been graded, like there's no final decision that is, that is make, made. So I would hope that at the beginning of next week, somewhere around like the beginning of next week, uh, um, all, all of that has been done. So once that's done, I'll post the grades uh, for our class and things like that. Uh, as I said, also like, yeah, there, we're also going to do some, besides that, we're going to do something else, but uh, I'll leave that for once it's announced to everyone simultaneously. But I think because as you saw, like uh, Respondus didn't uh, work. I mean, we'll still be using Respondus. I think we found like the source of the issue. So hopefully this, the same problems won't happen next time uh, or they should be minimized at least. But still like, we'll, like there are other things, like we'll do something in that other, calculus classes courses have done in the past. So like, but I'll mention that, I mean, that will, I'll say more about that next week. So I would say like uh, the scores per se, um, it won't be as bad as you think it is uh, after all these things has have been done. Uh, So, uh, and the solutions will be posted also uh, er, sometime er, early next week. Uh, is that okay? Are there any other questions? Good, good. Uh, yeah, but, um, right. Um, I'll, I will like, you know, I would say more about this. It's just like, I'm just trying to, do it at the same time as everyone else. So, but like uh, next uh, week, uh, I'll tell you more, but yeah, it, it will be uh, fine. I think uh, you'll see. <laughs> so um, yeah, okay. uh, let's continue then. Um, do, do, do. Uh, so today we're going to uh, keep talking about um, a, a little bit about limits and if we get um, more of how do you can represent a function of many variables like the domain and how it's like how the graph is supposed to look like. Um, let me just uh, finish this stuff about limits. Um, There's not much else to say. So just um, to finish limits, so back to limits. So I, as I said um, last time, if usually if you want to study, so say if you want to study, So say you want to study the limit um, as x, y approaches a comma b. Uh, 
um, of a particular function, right? So here's the point A comma B, and you want to study the limit as x, y approaches this point. So let me put here like x, y is maybe here, and you want x, y to get to reach this point, right? So remember again, like when you study a limit now, uh, there's like an analog of like one-sided limits uh, in Calc 1, like the one-sided limits were just like, um, you would look at the numbers from like, as you approach it from the right, or you would look at the numbers as you approach it from the left. But uh, now uh, in, in this class, like there are so many more options you could take. So like the two things that we discussed last time is that if you want to show that a limit does not exist, right? So like there are two basic strategies that we will use for like this class when it comes to limits. So like the two strategies are the following. So if you want to show that a limit does not exist, right? So to show does not exist, Uh, it is enough to find uh, two paths or two trajectories like we did last time where the the one-sided limits that you get give you different values, okay? It is enough uh, find uh, two paths or trajectories approaching a comma v um, whose uh, one-sided limits or which have uh, where the limit along this path uh, gives you uh, different values where the limits along these paths are different, are different values or give different values, okay? So in general, uh, for example, This is like most of the limits that you'll see are uh, as x comma y approaches zero zero. So if you put x comma y uh, zero zero, and you want to study the limit as x comma y approaches zero zero. So here are some examples. Uh, the sort of paths that usually one takes are like some options to try. Uh, like include like y equals x or y equals zero or x equals zero or y equals x squared. Sometimes you can even try quadratic stuff uh, like a parabola. Uh, you can try like more generally just like a line of con like of some slope like mx or like a parabola with some coefficient. In general, like almost anything that um, any function, uh, any any curve that passes through zero, you could try. So let me just draw some pictures here. You could try things like this, or you. And so if, if, if of these candidates, you just find two that give you different values and you're done. Is that okay? Is that making sense? Can you say that again? So if you find uh, just two, like if you choose two of these paths or trajectories and you find the limit and each of them give you different numbers, then you can conclude that the limit does not exist. Yes. It's, it's the analog of like, you know, the limit from the left 
the one-sided limit from the left being different from the one-sided limit from the right. Okay, it's more of a limit of one variable and then the other. Right, exactly. Uh, now that's, so this is what you want, like, this is what you want to do if you want to show that a limit does not exist, okay? So that will be typically the, like the only strategy we have. And if you want to show that a limit exists, uh, Uh, like basically the almost only option available to us is something similar to this squeeze uh, theorem that we uh, mentioned last time. So you do something like the squeeze theorem. Do uh, an argument like uh, the squeeze theorem. And so um, the idea here is that uh, you write X and Y in terms of polar coordinates. So you rewrite X as X equals R cosine of theta and Y as Y equals R sine of theta. And then you change uh, F of X comma Y into an expression of R and theta. Okay, and then you use the fact that um, the the usually like if they're trigonometric functions, then like they are always between negative one and one. Okay, so if if your expression has like sine of theta or cosine of theta, etc., then like or combinations of this. then uh, you use that the fact that like, you know, uh, they are uh, quantities between negative one and one. Uh, sorry, where, uh, yeah, so uh, what did I write about argument? Uh, are we, is, was that in part one or part two? Oh, uh, oh, okay. Like the squeeze theorem, I, I meant use an argument. like the squeeze theorem. So like just to uh, just to do like an example of each approach, like if you want, uh, like if you want to do like an example for case one, Let's say you're trying to study like the limit of as x approaches x y approach zero zero of x plus y divided by y minus x. Okay. So, like, if you wanted to show that this does not exist, like the idea would be to look at two different trajectories where the, where the values are not the same. So which trajectories can you think of? Like what would be like, what would be like a first um, option to try? Okay, good. Let's say if you try y equals zero, good, good. If you try y equals zero, this becomes, um, the only thing that survives, right, is x. So this gives you 
x plus, let me put it here. Is that making sense? And how much, uh, how much do you get here? What's the limit here? What would be the limit? Uh, good, that would be negative one, right? Now, what would be another option you could try? X equals zero. Good, good. Let's, and then I'll also show you a third one so that you see that they don't have to be um, so easy uh, so that you like, okay, so if you choose x equals zero, the only thing that survives is y, right? So you put here something like this. And so now the limit goes to zero, right? But in terms of y, and yeah, the limit would be now one. Is that making sense? And so since you found two who are different, then you're done. This is enough. So these two numbers are different, so you're done. Uh, so it does not exist, uh, but it's even like, uh, like there could have been more options. I want, they're not like, you know, you could have tried different things. So for example, you could also have used, you could also have used something more like exciting, like a parabola. So Y equals X squared. Okay. What happens if you try Y equals X squared? That's what you get, right? Um, Wait, would it be y plus x squared or x plus x squared? Oh, oh, I mean that. Um, oh, like, okay. You know, like uh, maybe let me do a picture. Like you're trying to approach the origin, right? So you you need to find like a path that takes you there, or like a curve, or like a a, a function, like however you want to think about it. So now I'm moving like along, I'm moving towards the origin along this curve. Is that making sense? So that's like uh, what I'm doing when I substitute Y with X squared. Is that okay? Good. Like, and so for example, the other two that we did before, like the other two were like y equals zero. So when y equals zero, you were, you were moving along the x axis. And when you did, uh, when we did like x equals zero, we were moving along the y axis, if, if that makes any sense. Uh, oh, let's, let's, um, let's check it out. Good, good. Like, uh, so before taking the limit, remember that you're supposed to simplify. So what, can, what simplifications can you make? You can cancel an X, right? So you can put like one plus X uh, over X minus one. And you all, before taking a limit, remember always to simplify as much as possible, right? Uh, is that making sense? Yes. Wait, why is that one again? Please explain. Oh, oh, this one. Um, uh, like why there's why there's a one here? Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm just factorizing an x everywhere in the like. Let me do an intermediate step. I'm factorizing an x in the numerator and an x in the denominator. And the x cancels out. Right, and so. then the x's cancel out. Yes. Is that making? Is that okay? No. Yeah. And, so, and, and then like, then this limit uh, actually gives you negative one, right? Is that okay? 
And so you see, like, if you had done the first and third options, that would not have worked because they just happened to agree. But if you, if you had done the second and third options, then that also would help allow you to say that the limit does not exist. Oh, oh, it's just because, like, right, 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 right. I just had to, like, you know, usually for these limits, you just have to be given like an expression. So I just came up with this expression because it's sort of easy to analyze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like uh, just to try the water, test the waters. But uh, but you see, like, so one and three, they're fine. It's just that they give you the same answer. So you cannot conclude anything yet. So if you had done one and two, or two and three, then, then you can say that the limit does not exist. But like the point is that you have like almost like infinitely many options to choose from, right? Because like you don't necessarily need to stop at a parabola. You could have tried like a straight line or like even something like sine of x, y equals sine of x. You can go more, do more crazy stuff. Usually you don't want to go super crazy if that's not needed. So sometimes you just try like the easiest cases. Uh, but it's just to show you that it, like on occasion, like you may try something more complicated and it still uh, will work. Is that okay? And then, um, um, Let me do an example of the other case where you want to show that a limit does exist. So let's say that you wanted to analyze um, something like this. Uh, yes, I think this will work, okay? Like, obviously it's not clear, like how do you know which example falls into which case, right? Like whether you should try to show that a limit exists or does not exist. Uh, like, and, 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 like it, it is something like once at, at one ends up recognizing with practice, usually because like the only way we have for showing that a limit exists is by using like polar coordinates if you look at like if you, the function happens to have like a combination that is common in polar coordinates like x squared plus y squared right like that typically appears a lot of the time in polar coordinates so that tells you that um you should try um po polar coordinates um well the actually you cannot um uh factorize this so easily um, or it depends on how you mean x with uh, x squared and y squared, but at, like this sum uh, really is not so. Uh, there's not like an obvious factorization for the numerator. Um, but let's see how how this looks like in polar coordinates. So again, in polar coordinates, x becomes r cosine of theta and y becomes r sine of theta, right? And so this gives you the limit as r goes to zero of what? What happens with x? x becomes r to the four cosine to the cosine four to the fourth of theta plus, and then y becomes y, uh, like becomes r to the four Is that making sense? Is, is, is a numerator okay? So I'm doing the substitution, right? And then what happens with the denominator? What can you replace that with? Well, uh, uh, it becomes like, well, let's let's write it all like it becomes r squared cosine square of theta, right? 
plus R squared sine squared of theta. But I don't know if you remember from last time that cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, right? So you end up with limit as R goes to zero of R to the four cosine to the four of theta plus R to the four sine to the four of theta over R squared. Is, is, that, is that making sense? And so you see, uh, what you can do now is like factorize an R to the four. Like, let me do that here. Like I, we could have factorized from now, like an R to the four in this step. Okay. Um, you're asking why not R to the four in the bottom, on the bottom? Oh, it's because you're just squaring uh, you're just squaring uh, x and y at the bottom. So you cannot get like a power four anywhere here in the denominator. Uh, now, this uh, right, like the identity, uh, the identity is that cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Like cosine to the four plus sine to the four actually is not anything straight, like obvious. Like there's no identity for what that is. So let me put it here. But you can, uh, um, I suppose it's interesting that you cannot really do the same. I, like there's no analog of that identity if you have like the power for um, cosine and sine. Is that okay? But at least you can, you know, you can simplify a little bit more this expression because uh, you can cancel, you know, like uh, the R squared can be canceled with some of the R squares on top, right? Like there, so uh, you cannot cancel like all the R's in the numerator. Uh, uh, oh, oh. Uh, Kind of, almost, almost, almost. That's uh, like, because a squared plus b squared squared is a to the four plus two a squared b squared plus uh, b to the four. You see, there's this common, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, right, like you wrote, like, it's not the same. Yeah, yeah, exactly, good, good. Uh, that, this would be like the correct identity. But yeah, like there's like a mixed term and that's, uh, that's why you cannot do this, the same thing with the to the force, the powers force. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a fun way to write not equal, different. Uh, good. Is this okay so far? So good. Uh, is this making sense? So, and this is almost ready for the squeeze theorem uh, because the, the, like the point is that uh, we know that this R wants to get re really, really small. This is going to zero. Uh, the th and like the thing about the stuff that involves the theta, uh, the angle, like the, the th like the angle, like, you know, as you approach the origin, the point is that the angle can be like sort of sp spiraling down like it doesn't necessarily need to approach like a specific value the angle but what you can say is that um like this uh, the squeeze argument so the squeeze theorem argument is that um um you know like science um sine to the four of theta, it's, uh, you know, it's always between zero and one. Is that making sense? Uh, it, uh, it, you, put, you can put a zero here because like this is like a positive number, right? Because it's like the square of a square. So this is always going to be non-negative. And you can put one here because like sine is always between zero and one. And when you start multiplying it with itself, you always get numbers between zero and one. Is that, is that making sense? Um, 
you don't make yourself a millionaire, right? If the interest rate is between zero and one. Uh, I mean, if you if you're not not the interest rate, but like if you sort of were like if you got if you were paid like a like your a fraction of what you what were paid like last month, like and the fraction like uh, multiplied by something between zero and one, like you you would just keep shrinking, right? So and the same happens for cosine to the four, right? So what do you think you could say about the sum of these two quantities? Like the as the highest it could go is two, right? Is that is that okay? And in fact, like for this argument to work, you don't need to be so clever to get like a two here. You could have put like 200 or 2000 or 2 million and the argument uh, will still work. I mean, you just need to make sure that the quantity is between two fixed values. Okay. So it doesn't matter that much that here there's a two. It could have been 10 or 20 or, or 100. So like like the only thing that you need is uh, the, uh, this to be a... So only need this to be a fixed number. So 20 or 200 or 10 would have worked. Or uh, any other number basically. And so why, why is that? Because like the limit that we care about is not precisely this quantity, it's just multiply by R squared. So you can take this inequality and multiply every single side of the inequality by R squared. And so you get the following. Uh, we are multiplying by R squared because the limit that we care about has an R squared uh, multiplying all of this. You see for the, the original limit, uh, Why did you go with two R squared as opposed to just R squared? I mean, uh, it's just because there was a two here, uh, which we obtained by adding together these two inequalities, right? I see. And so okay. it, now, strictly speaking, not that much would have gone wrong if you have just written R squared. It's not 100% correct. I mean, I think it is true because you can be a little bit more clever to, but uh, like, yeah, the easiest thing is just to start from here. So like what I'm just doing is um, like what I, what I did here was multiply by R squared. Uh, yeah, so, so what, I, what I'm saying is that strictly speaking, like, I think it's true that sine square, it is most likely true that sine to the four plus cosine to the four is always between zero and one, but the easiest thing that you can, you know, because sine and cosine, like sort of, they take opposite values, you know, when sine is at a minimum, cosine is at a max and things like that. So like that could help you get more information, but like the easiest thing to put here in the upper bound is two, because that's what you get by if you add, if you add, every single side of the inequality. And so, um, uh, if you just want to play it safe and don't want to think too much, just put like 200 and minus 200 on both sides or whatever, and that usually just works. Like, you know, like you could have, if you put like here 2000, like then you're done. You like, you're completely sure that like this would be fine. If you really wanted to, could you use a power reducing formula on the, trig functions yeah. to like get right. more insight 
Yeah, okay. exactly. You would need to start playing with the identities or like, yeah, you can keep playing with the identities with trick functions if you're really obsessed of knowing okay. that the, if the best value you can put here is two. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not two because as you're saying, you can just start playing with the identities. I don't know. I mean, I would have to think if you can really put one here. Uh, it should be, definitely would be somewhere between one and two, but. Um, um, Got it. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. But, uh, you know, like you don't want to kill yourself over this bounce. So you just put like something that you, uh, easy enough that, you know, will work. But like the idea now is that, uh, you know, now this quantity is squeezed between two things that go to zero. I mean, well, the left-hand side is already uh, zero in a sense, but uh, this thing goes to zero, right? As R goes to zero. So this is already zero, nothing to do here. And so uh, by squeeze argument that forces this limit to be zero. Is that, is that making sense? Yes. So essentially these are like the two typical problems about limits. Uh, if you want to show that it does not exist, you do like the, the, the things that we were doing of playing with different formula, like different equations or, or for, uh, formulas between Y and X. And if you want to show that a limit does exist, you do this thing of like rewriting everything in polar coordinates, okay? Um, where, oh, 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 right, right, right. Um, those, uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, like with polar with squeeze usually the limit is zero i would need to think a little bit like i um i'll think about an example with squeeze theorem where, uh, that will give you i mean like okay uh let's see would this work oops yeah i'll think about it if it's easy to come by um uh Okay, uh, yes, like sort of it's obvious from once you write it like that, that um, that it should be zero, the limit. Um, but at least you should say by squeeze theorem or like you should like the magical words need to be somewhere written. Like just because like implicitly in your head, you're like just realizing that cosine to the four plus sine to the four won't mess up the behavior of, of that limit, right? So the keywords, squeeze theorem do need to be written somewhere. If like, yeah, is that making sense? Uh, and then there's an easier case. Uh, this is an easy case that you'll probably only see on the MyLab problems, but uh, it's good to to this, at least mention it. Uh, so when the, uh, that's when the function is continuous at a point, okay? Continuous uh, I don't know if you remember what the definition of continuity was, but um, 
the definition in this case is that uh, f of x comma y is continuous at a comma v if if the limit can just be found by agrees with the value of the function at that point right so the definition of continuity um just is that the limit equals the value of the function at the point is that okay does this look familiar is this essentially the same that you saw in, in calc one except that now there's an extra variable right So the only thing that you need to know here is that like the functions that you know from before uh, con continue to be continuous. <laughs> so uh, like which functions are continuous here, like in this context? Um, well, basically polynomials like trigonometric functions. Like I mean here polynomials of X and Y, trigonometric functions. I'll, I'll give you some examples in a second. So uh, which depend on X and Y. And like also like say exponentials are those are typical the typical like functions that you know about. Or combinations of these like. They they are all of them are continuous. Um, are continuous at any point where the uh, the fun this like the expression is uh, at any point of the domain. So all of these things, all of them are continuous I think I'm miswriting continuity at any point of the domain of the function. Okay, so again, like this sounds more complicated than what it is. Like what I'm saying is basically that you can just plug in the values. So say if you wanted to Let's say you wanted to study this uh, this limit of Okay, let's say I gave you this expression um, and I asked you what the limit is. So basically what I'm saying is that um, since you're going to plot, since you're looking at this, uh, at this limit at values of X and Y, where this is not undefined, like, you know, undefined, I just mean that you get like something like zero over zero, right? Uh, you just can uh, plug in the numbers and then you're done. So that's the limit.
is that making sense so like i mean there's nothing too exciting but like you may see a couple of problems on my lab where uh, the limit that you need to compute is just found like this like just by plugging in the numbers and so the reason why you can do that is sort of because of, mm, if you thought of this as defining a function um the, the the this function is continuous at the point pi over two comma three and so that's why you can just plug it in is that okay Well, right. Like in both, like if you look at the other, let's sorry. Let me go back to us uh, for a second here. Right. If you had tried to plug in like naively, you just get zero over zero, which was why, you, which is why you had to do something more sophisticated. And also, if you go to the first example, right. If you just try to plug in naively, you get zero over zero. So that's why you also have to analyze this more carefully. So whenever plugging in does not work. Typically, that means that you have to do something else. If plugging in works, then essentially, like usually, that's just like the value of the limits. So, like, um, like these examples, they don't tend to appear as like exam problems, right? Because like there's almost nothing to do. But I'm just saying that like if you like, they there are some like this on my lab. So. Um, Is that okay? Um, like they're uh, like they're okay. They're a little bit more. Um, uh, there's some that also are a combination, like a little bit more sophisticated, but still not by a large amount. Like say something like this. Okay, so again, like this one, like if you look at, um, if you look at ex an expression like this, if you just try to find the limit, you would get like zero over zero, right? Because like X is going to zero. So this looks bad, right? So you cannot really work with, like you cannot do the plugging immediately, right? But it is similar to like more like this called one problems where you may do like a simplification first and then you can take the limit. So uh what like what what's the simplification here yeah you factorize an x right so and then you can cancel right right good sorry a should be zero two And so now the plugging in is allowed. You can you are allowed to plug in, and so you get zero plus two, which is just two. Is that okay? So like there uh, uh, some problems which are in, in like in the middle middle of the road in terms of difficulty, where it's not just as easy as plugging in directly, but it's not as bad as either doing the squeeze theorem or like doing trying different trajectories you just need to simplify a little bit the expression like factor factorization or things like that so that you can find like the value of the limit is that making sense So uh, now this is essentially like what you need to know about limits. Um, let me mention something that I didn't say from us. Uh, so this stuff about, sorry, just to maybe write this on the top. Um, this stuff about limits is in section 
14 2. I don't think we'll do 14.3 today. So let me erase that. And so let me just finish today by mentioning something like from 14.1 that I didn't say last time, which is about level curves and level surfaces. So now, um, Okay. Uh, before, uh, I mean, before writing anything on the iPad, I'll um, show you some animations. About this. Uh, let's go to GeoGebra. Can everyone see the, yeah, uh, GeoGebra? So, um, like, so for example, uh, um, I, here I wrote the function of two variables, x squared plus y squared, okay? Uh, Maybe this is obvious like that the graph will look like this. Um, that's okay if, if right now you don't um, see why that's the case. But so on like the point here of this animation is that on the left side, you are being shown, shown the graph, right? So before the age of computers, right? If you actually wanted to see the graph, like, right, well, you could draw it still on a piece of paper, but, um, it, it, it would have been more tricky, right? I, I think you could have done is more like, um, it, which is like maybe something you have seen like uh, in like maps, right? Like uh, cartography or like of navigation, right? For boats, like maps of the ocean or whatever, is that instead of like having, carrying with you like a picture of the graph itself, you can look at the level curves. So the level curves mean uh, just to represent on a plane, right, on the domain, uh, all the points where the function takes the same value, okay? So for example, here, um, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing the value two, so that, I mean, that means that I'm looking at all the points whose, uh, where the function takes the value two, which in the graph means like all the points that are at height two. Is that making sense? So um, yeah, it's like topography, right? Like that's the word I was looking for. So do you see like in the picture that there's like the number two or like on the y on the z axis, and so you, like this is representing to you like all the points uh, of, of of height two, right? Is, is that making sense? Uh, that makes like. Uh, like uh, a shadow, right? Like this curve really lives on the surface on the graph, but like it's again, more convenient to just draw the shadow on the XY plane. And that's the circle that you see here. Is that okay? So, um, so like that means that, uh, you know, this is actually, I think for your generation it's more like, like the games analogies are more like uh, appropriate. Like when you have like these video games like the RPGs where you have like a map of where you're moving and you see like on those maps of like the terrain, like sort of curves like this and like for the height, right? And they are indicating to you like, oh, if you move along this curve, like the height remains constant, right? So imagine like this were like the sort of like the square that shows like when you're playing and the, of like the terrain and it, it's telling you, oh, these are all the points where the height is too. Is that making sense? So, uh, and like, you know, as you increase the height, like the, the radius of the circle increases because you, we're, you're moving upwards and the, and the graph like sort of gets bigger. Um, and if you were to decrease the height, 
there they'll you'll reach an extreme case where it collapses to a point right so at height zero there's only one point where the value of the function is zero right which is uh, at the origin so that's why you only see the origin and be below zero there's no graph anymore so you don't see any level curves is that making sense so there's nothingness it's like a uh, big bang. There's nothing else there. Uh, height zero, you see a point, and then it, they just keep increasing. Is that okay? Um, the, I guess, uh, it depends what you mean by um, the complex uh, plane in this. Uh, there's no, uh, if by complex plane, you mean something related to like complex numbers, like in this class, strictly speaking, like the complex numbers no longer exist. So it, it, this is just like a picture, like, let me do a different graph, a, a different function. Let's say you look at the function sine of X times cosine of Y. That's a cute one. Do you see it? Yes. So, and let, let's make it bigger because um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Ooh, good. <laughs> so now you like you see like this is a graph, and there are tons of places where the height is one point seven. That just means like there are tons of places where the the value of the function is one point seven, right? Uh, and if you just had the x, y plane, right, like the domain, this is telling you if you walk on any of these, they're sort of like circles, right? They're not quite circles, but like there's some close curve, right? They're like, you know, more, more rectangular than a circle typically is. So it's not like quite like a circle, but this is telling you if you move, um, so I guess it's funny, like it collapses to a square, like at, at high zero, which is cool. Um, but this is, this is telling you, if you look at different places where the height is of certain value, you get like these curves downstairs, like, and so again, this just means, uh, you're moving, uh, if you just move, if you just walk on this curve, right, without like exiting the curve, then you will always measure the height to be 1.8, for example. So like you, you know, like for example, you could think of this function as giving you the temperature at the point X comma Y, right? So if this is giving you the temperature at point X comma Y, this is telling you all these points on the plane uh, have, have constant temperature, right? So this is, is called like an isothermal curve. Is that okay? Because it would be like curves of constant temperature. So far, so good. So like, and again, like you can play, like this is fun. Like you can just try different options like for level curves, like you could like, I mean, for functions, you could put like Y times sine of X and see what you get. Like if you do different possibilities. Okay. So, but I mean, this is sort of like the idea of a level curve. So let me go back to the iPad. So the idea of a level curve is, um, It's what I just drew there. Like um, you have a function of two variables and then you have the graph. And again, the graph, you sort of think of it as um, some sort of like membrane or surface. So this is like the graph of f of x comma y. And a level curve 
the level curve at value at, at height C, right? So the level curve, this is actually the equation of a plane. This is like a plane parallel to the X, Y plane. So this is really like the plane Z equals, I mean, like, okay, like then two letters sound very, uh, yeah, B, right, sorry, before in the animation, it was called B. Uh, that's like the thing that's moving along the Z axis, right? So it's, you're making like cuts, you know, bread cuts. If you think of this like as a piece of bread, like you're making different cuts, slices, and as you move, as you vary the, the B or like what I'm calling now little C, like you get like different cuts, right? Is that making sense? So the level curve, uh, this is like, this is called the level curve is typically called like this. So it just consists of all the points where the value of the function f equals a little c. So it consists of all the points x comma y where the value of f equals c. So where So let, 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 like, uh, let's do an example, like the first one that we did before, uh, in the animation. So what are the level curves? Of like the function X comma Y, F of X comma Y equals to X squared plus Y squared, right? Uh, this again was like this salad bowl that I showed you. And so you're really looking at the cuts of the between the graph, like the, the intersection between the graph and the and, and this plane at height C. So what you need to do, like what you do is like you solve. So basically, or uh, you, like the only thing that you do is like you set the, the function equal to the letters, the constant C, okay? So, and from here, uh, you have to like sort of recognize this as a curve on the X, Y plane. So what does this curve look like? Uh, like what's the equation, like what's the equation of this? It's like a circle of radius square root of C, right? So this like you recognize as a circle. Right, and so like usually the way in which the level curves are written is that like, So like what you do is like start choosing like different values for uh, C. So when C equals one, the, 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 that's like, the, this consists of all the points where the value of the function is one. This corresponds to a circle of radius one. But like when Z equals four, this corresponds to a function like this corresponds to all the points where the value of the function equals four, but this is a circle of radius two now because like there's a square root, right? And like, say for example, when uh, Z equals nine, then this is a circle of radius three.
Is, is that making sense? So again, if you thought of this as a radar on a game, this means like if you move on this circle of radius three, the value of the function that you measure is nine. If you move on um, this circle of radius two, you measure value four. And if you move on this circle of radius one, you measure value one, okay? Is that making sense? Let's do another example. So um, let's do the level curves. What are the level curves of Again, what you do is like you take the function and just set it equal to a constant C. So and then you have to somehow recognize like how this look like what curve you get on the XY plane. So how would you recognize uh, the equation of this like curve? Or what could you do? Any ideas? Well, let's square both sides of the equation. What happens if you do that? You get this, right? And now, what is that? What what the equation do you what equation does that, does that correspond to? They're just lines, right? Like uh, with negative slope. So, and different intercepts. So for example, if you choose um, C equals one, right? Like the intercept goes through one. So this is C equals one, like the level curve is one minus X. But if you choose C equals two, then it passes through four. And if you, so this is like the, like the value four and this is the value one. And if you choose like say C equals three, then you get equals Y nine minus X. So in, in a 3D uh, graph, would this just be like a plane? Uh, so let's check it out. So the level curves, right? Like, well, what that means, you have to be more careful because like that means, like that means that above each of these lines, right? <laughs> That's actually a good question. Uh, this is a, like, it's not actually like a plane, like, but it, sorry, is, is the screen blurry? Is that happening? 
No, the screen's not blurry for me. Okay, okay. So, but no, that's a great question. Uh, but C needs to be leaving. So let me go back to, sorry, let me go back to GeoGebra for a second. So let's look at what the, like the level, like the graphics. Do, do you see it? Uh, it is, uh, it's just that the cuts, it's just that the values, uh, cut, like the values where the height is the same, it, like they're sort of like segments on the, on the graph, right? There are line segments on the graph, but that doesn't mean that the graph itself is like a plane. You see, like it's a little bit curved. It's gonna look like uh, the graph of root x on like in the right. if you just like, y yeah, root x. Yeah, it's like a because it's like square root of x plus y, so it has like qualitatively the same features of root of x. If you think of root of x, it's not quite like a straight line, right? It's like a little bit like bent. Yeah. So. But this is just, but it's a good question because this is saying that even if the level curves are, are lines, that doesn't mean that the graph itself is, uh, is a line because it's just me, it's like, the thing is like you can stack, you know, you can like combine a bunch of lines together in such a way that there's some bent to them, which is what's going on here. Is that okay? Perfect. But no, this is a great example because like, it, uh, you, right, like you could try to ask, well, if I know how all the level curves look like, can I just like reconstruct the, the graph itself? Uh, and you see like, you have to be more careful because the reason why uh, it's not like a plane, it, like another way to see it is like, let me go back to the iPad. Like, because it's like, a, actually this is like a rec, like imaging problem, right? Like this is actually useful like for computer science or things like that, like a shape analysis. Like if you have like a bunch of data, like of partial images, right? How can you rebuild like a 3D model of, of an object? Like you can imagine this is what happens like if you're being scanned, like in medicine, right? Like where like maybe they start taking like, like scans, of, but like there are sort of like slices of your brain Right, and then like, how can you reconstruct like a three D model of how the brain looks like? Uh, the reason is that if you think about it, there's like uh, the intercept, right? It's sort of like it's not it's not like a linear relationship because like you're squaring the in like the, the the equations appear with like the value of the uh, of c squared, right? So the fact that it's not linear, uh, like the fact that when the value is c you are squaring the equation of the line tells you that there's like the growth of these lines, the way in which you are stacking them together is not precisely linear. It, I mean, it's a little bit hard to explain just in words, but it's just, it has to go sort of, there's sort of like a growth rate uh, because of the fact that uh, this variable is not squared. If you um, graph the contour lines at uh, like regular intervals, like regular linear intervals, uh, just like, you know, C equals, you know, every, every two values. So it's like zero, two, four, six. And then there's right. a um, exponential relationship between the variables. Right. Uh, well, uh, it's exactly. It's not, I mean, exponential is not the quite the right terminology. It's called more like polynomial. Uh, it does make like a big of a difference. Like, you know, exponential would be, uh, it would be increasing even better. Like uh, it would be like e to the c, right? Uh, but yeah, it's not like, um, it, it's not, it happened something similar here, like where, you know, the radius was like the square root of the value. So they're not like, you know, when you increase the radius by one, like the value is not increasing by one, right? Like there's like a, a, a uh, shit, like there's like a gap, a difference on, on the growth rates. Right. So, but no, that's a good point. And um, then, good, good. Um, so with different order uh, equations, <clears throat> uh, if you're spacing out contour lines, um, do you generally, like, do you, do people ever uh, adjust the intervals between the contour lines to like, I uh, yes. work, work with the equation. 
Right, I, I'm sure that you could do this like, right, like if you go into more like visual, visual analysis of experimental data, you know, like that also some, sometimes happens like in the physics experiments where like you pl like plot Y against like log of X. I don't know if you have ever done this. Like, yeah, right? no, exactly. That's exactly yeah. kind of what you I'm thinking. You can do like a logarithmic scale or like a polynomial scale, like a, a square root scale so that like you sort of compensate for this uh, difference. And then maybe once you change scales, then you do see like a plane, right? Because you have distorted like the distances. Exactly. Uh, you're measuring the scales. Right. It's yeah. it, certain data sets. If you put them on a log log plot, suddenly yeah. you have something that looks linear. Yes, actually, this is something what we would do when we change variables for integrating. Uh, when we switch to different variables of integration, like making it like similar to a substitution, like x equals square root of u or x equals u squared, which you use in Cal one. Like what happened is that uh, essentially you're rescaling the x axis, so you make like a distortion, and this is why you have to introduce like a factor which is called the Jacobian that will make the value of the integral come correctly because you have sort of distorted like space when you do those things. Perfect. Uh, Thank you. So now the last thing that I will mention right now is that um, there's an analog of this for cold level surfaces. Okay. So this is for functions of three variables. So for f of x, y, z. So this is three variables. And so the issue here is that really we cannot look at the domain, at the graph, because the graph would require us, I'll, I'll repeat this next time, but the problem now is that the graph would require like, you know, a fourth axis. So the problem is that we cannot see the graph. Uh, because we would need a, a, a like a, a fourth perpendicular axis to everything because we would need a fourth axis, a fourth dimension. Like it, that's like really the better way to say this. But you can sort of still, even if you cannot see the, the, the graph, you can still make sort of by that analogy, the same cuts, like there's like a, graph which is a higher dimensional bean and you can cut it and but now the cuts like these slices where the function has the same values now the look like surfaces they won't look like uh like curves so you can still like the level curves now i'll, I'll do like an example next time we would just be f of x comma y comma z equals like an, a number c and this will be like surfaces where the value of the function is the same so like this is like all the points x, y, z. I'll repeat this next time, so don't worry. Uh, where value of f equals c. Sorry, I should make, put here level surfaces. Right? That's what I meant. Where f has value c. And now this will look like surfaces. And we'll do some examples next time. But this is what people like, for example, um, if you think of F as being like a potential, gravitational potential or electric potential, that's like these surfaces are like the, like the thing that people call like equipotential surfaces. It's just like a surface in space where the value of the electric potential is constant and things like that. Or it would be like the value in space where the temperature is constant and, and stuff like that. So we'll do like two examples next time. They're like similar to the previous ones. They're like, you just set the function equal to a number and then you just have to recognize what the look, how that looks like. So, Uh, so this question about, sorry, if I did I miss that question. Usually the level curves, we play with them so that you can write them as Y equals something so that it's easier to recognize how they look like. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I think it is a good place to end. So yeah, I'll see you uh, next week. If uh, So yeah, yeah, good.
Professor. Yes. I have a question regarding uh, future exam preparation. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I noticed on the exam that uh, the questions two and three, um, they started out with, I think they had like two or three parts each. Uh, oh, the right, first right, right, part, right. The first part was uh, <clears throat> a little bit more elementary. And then the subsequent parts were sort of uh, sy sy synthesizing a lot of the concepts that were later on in our sections. Um, and I don't feel like the problems in Pearson gave uh, enough of a synthesis uh, where like I, I felt prepared for the exam. So, uh, for instance, there, there was one where it was like intersecting a plane with half of a cone. Right. And I don't I, I don't think there was <clears throat> anything on Pearson or uh, quiz problems that was like on that level of rigor. And I'm curious where I can like get exposure to that pretest. So the thing like, for example, the plane with the cone, the, um, like the like the Mylab problems, like it, they do get harder as the course, course progresses. Um, right now they there were there are like you know the chapters of vectors and things like that they like they're more elementary than like so the problems are less sophisticated like the exam uh but like say if you look at the line problem um most of like most of the people actually got that one most of it correct it's just that uh the execution at failed a little bit in the end, but it, it was like, you know, if you draw the cone, like I can show you, I'll post the, uh, the solutions uh, next week, but. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not asking you to solve anything right now. I'm just, I'm curious, like it was uh, so, clearly, a more, clearly a more uh, like all encompassing problem that just covered like all of the, con it covered Right, it, it's like a combination of, uh, you're saying like, it's like more like a combination of individual MyLab problems, basically. Right, right. Like right, MyLab right. problems were very like this concept, this concept, and then the test was Right, like, right, right. But if you look that. at the old exam problems, like most of the old exam problems also had like three or four parts, right? Right. Uh, the practice problems. Now, you could say they're not like, they were not like sort of the, like, they were not asking the same way, but you know, like, all there's always like a, like a variation of how the exam problems are, are asked. Like, um, like if like what I'm like what I'm just saying about this particular problem is that if you draw the cone and you draw the plane, right? Uh, you just see like a line. So this problem was secretly like just about uh, a straight line, uh, but it it has different parts. That's true, but. Uh, you know, if you know how to do individually the parts, like. Like the MyLab problems will help you more to know, like understand how to do each of the separate parts on it on their own, right? Uh, right. And, and then you have to like build them to put them together, but it is not that different from how the building up of the questions were on the practice problems. Uh, okay. Like, but, I, I, yeah, I, I do agree that the Myla problems are like more like um, atomistic, you know, it's like an atom versus a molecule. Like the Myla problems are more like atoms. Uh, the, the exam problems are more like molecules, if you want. Uh, so, so when preparing for the exam, I mean, I only got to do the practice. I did the first two practice exams twice, and I only got to do the last one once. And I still felt, uh, I don't know. It, I don't know. So like, uh, like I can tell you, for example, that uh, most of the people did get correct this part where they just wrote like the curve in terms of T, right? Uh, actually, right. if and if once you do that, if you were able to do that, like, then like you can almost forget it, almost of entirely of what the picture was supposed to look like because then you're asked like to find like the velocity and the curve. I mean, it's true. Like it sort of builds on the previous parts, but like they like actually this problem was pretty good like the one that went a little bit more problematic was the second one um 
but uh, I mean, you'll see the solutions. But I agree that, yeah. like, yeah, that they they do have, like, you know, each individual part of you probably would see, like, as a MyLab question, like, probably. Um, right, right. Uh, but uh, it's whether the like it's like whether the like the sum of the parts equals the what's the, the phrase like it, it's not the same as the totality or like the total equals the sum of the parts whether or not that's true. I mean, if you like if you look at the practice exams, like they also had like uh, three or four parts. So uh, well, I but, think I think that my lab may may just be even a little deceiving because when they're teaching the little segments of each concept. Um, they oftentimes give like a, a kind of rote format in between each of the questions. And the exam question broke that format, which ended up putting the final answer into like a different form or different state than I'm used to seeing. And so I felt oh, uncomfortable. You mean like the with, way in which the question was like, you were asked to type the answer. I uh, know more so like how the answer simplified down, like everything that they gave us uh, on like uh, per parameterization of some curves had like sine, uh, sine squared and cosine squared, which eventually it simplified down to the identity of one uh, under the square oh, right, root right, and then right, 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 right. a constant block. And so uh, when I started not seeing those, I was like, wait, <laughs> am I doing something wrong? Does the process change? And, and I think that's I part of what threw me off. So I see, I see. yeah. Uh, I hope I hope that help at least it helps explain what I, I guess uh, what I experienced. Right, right. But yeah, it's true in general. I mean, it is also true that the mile of problems do become a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, uh, the next, like starting more with like um, with finding optimization problems. I don't necessarily like for now. They still are more a little bit more elementary. Like. Uh, once you get to fourteen point five or six in the in the book, like in two more three two or more uh, two or three more sections, then they do become more intricate, like the my lab problems. But yeah, like like the idea was to some extent that like um, if you had seen like the like how the exam problems were like the practice exam problems were structured like. They tended to have like three or four parts each. Uh, so it's just like, right, it's true. Like how they're being combined is different from one practice exam version to another, which is also different from like the actual questions on the exam. But um, once, like, once I think once you like see like uh, the solutions, you are like, oh, yeah, like sort of each part individually, I know how to do, right? Like it's just whether or not you can like uh, combine them together. Um, well, I think I'm also just looking at uh, how part B was done in this cone and plane question. And oh, right, right. Uh, like so many of the practice problems in uh, my lab made it seem like we would always uh, take the derivative to get to the velocity equation and then just uh, take the integral. With, and like, I know that that would, would that have worked as well in this well, case? This is I don't know if you can still see the iPad, but that's exactly what you did here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I see uh, you still plugged in. You take, the derivative? you take the derivative with respect to t, right? Right. And, and then you find the norm of it because you had to find the speed. Yeah. It's just that this one, the norm is a little bit easier because like the derivative became a constant, right? It, it has no t's. Uh, yeah. uh, no but then you still integrate it. Yeah. Uh, just now that it's uh, only you and me on the chat, I can let you know that my accommodations oh. still haven't come in. So I definitely felt the panic of 35 oh, minutes in the short exam. Oh, it's, I'm still recording this anyway. So like, <laughs> well, to anyone who made it to the end of the recording, what's up? <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying like, no, no, it was exactly like, you know, it, it was, it could be done with an integral, right? Like in, now you're saying that, right. In the, the MyLab integrals had like trick functions, right? Um, but, right, they all hit, yeah. Right, but in a sense, it's sort of easier that this one had only like numbers, right? Like this one not, it didn't even have like, now I guess it could be confusing, right? Because if you're used to just seeing like things that have trick functions and you just run into something that has like just plain numbers. Yeah, that's like, what I'm saying. Right, 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 right. It was just like, and and uh, like, it's, it's weird, it bothers me because like conceptually I was there, I knew that, Right. I was on the right path, but then the numbers 
Uh, again, I guess there's almost a downfall to always having the practice problems come out to pretty numbers. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, I mean, that depends on how, like, uh, like the thing that some practice problems were like just like problems that were not randomized and others were randomized. And so those who, which were randomized probably had like things which would involve a little bit more like square roots. Uh, like, um, I think square roots were sort of like the worst thing that you saw, like the solutions you had to enter for, 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 um, these functions, for example. But I mean, right, like it could be like square root of 130, for example, or like here, here's like square root of 130, right? Like uh, nothing that you can simply, I mean, you can sort of try to simplify, but you cannot simplify that much more. Right, and and I guess that's that's the other thing uh, that I kind of forgot from Calc 2, which is don't simplify with the final answer. Once you've already done the operation, just right. leave it and move on to the next. Um, so that's another testing strategy thing that I guess I forgot. But also, yeah, when you're working on Pearson, occasionally they do give you, you know, square roots in final answers, but right. I mean, it, it almost always simplifies at least a couple of steps and they want it simplified. Right. And so you're used to like, uh, you know, factoring out stuff and canceling things. And right, uh, right, right. You know, a lot of times it's like, oh, the final answer was actually just two. Right, right. right. <laughs> so not getting uh, clean answers sometimes I guess I've started to rely on that too much as an indicator of whether I'm on the right track or not right 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 yeah like so. for these things like I mean it's not that you should like yeah definitely you should not probably expect answers that involve like a hundred thousand or like a million but if it's an answer like that has like 137 or like square root of 137 or sine of two gradients or things like that then that's okay that's something that can show up yeah 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 okay, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, it was definitely a first exam. So, but yeah, but it it was like it was. I think um, not as bad. I mean, like the one that uh, was most problematic was actually number two. Uh, one was pretty good. Three wow. was relatively okay, and then two, like the execution that one did, uh, go a little bit off the rails. But like. I actually thought that three was going to be more complicated than two. And so sometimes one's expectations do not, uh, but like most people knew, like uh, once you knew how to find the parametrization, like then you just follow the formulas and like, yeah, if you just follow the formulas without questioning whether like the numbers that you're getting are to be expected, then like it's less problematic, I think. Oh yeah, well, and, and that was another thing. I don't know, I, I didn't know you guys would account for like uh, if you got part B wrong and then part C relied on the answer from part B, I guess. Well, that would just be not in the sense. Work. Well, like, for example, if you had like put like here, like in the version that I did, like I, it, it had to have like an eight here, right? Uh, it, imagine that you had put like a six, right? Uh, right. That's essentially a correct solution. Like if you do everything else correct. So like you get like most of the problem, right? Right. Yes, so there's like something like that was still applied here. Um, so the prop, like the numerical issues would not propagate to the remaining parts as long as you sort of wrote like a strategy that made sense. Uh, so like as long as you try to find, as long as you try to find the derivative and as long as you used to try to find like some sort of integral, it, it doesn't matter. Didn't matter that much if like the numerical values that you found were correct or not. It was. Uh, if I, if I go back to my short exam work, um, I think I might actually be able to see the erasure marks of where I deleted, where I erased my uh, attempt at finishing out the problem. Oh, well, I mean, like, uh, once I post oh, no, the I think, solutions and make them yeah. available, we can go over those things. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I okay. mean, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Okay, Thanks no, for no. Uh, yeah. just looking over this with me. All right. I'll see you uh, on Monday. Yeah. yeah, yeah. See you on Monday. All right. Bye. Bye.